<laughs> I saw this. Uh, I saw this one. It was uh, the gingerbread man from Shrek was the original hawk tulip. <laughs> Eaten. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not the gumdrop button. Not the gumdrop buttons. <clears throat> Do you know the muffin man? The muffin man? The muffin man! The muffin man! <laughs> 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 well, wait, too much about me. I think, dude, those movies are so good. Dude, Shrek, Shrek is, is, is was ahead of its time because it was made. It wasn't made by Disney. It was made by DreamWorks, and DreamWorks was. Definitely on the side of let's entertain the parents just as much as the, the kids. So there's all kinds of innuendos in those movies. Oh, yeah. It's I mean, it's, it's Farquaad. It's <laughs> Lord Farquaad. I wonder really if he's compensating he's for something. <laughs> <laughs> Men like him are in short supply. <laughs> Pick number three, my lord. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of Into the Lion's Den with your hosts, Ryan Karras and Christian Griffith, brought to you proudly by Pride Roofing and Construction. And hopefully he's in. <laughs> he's going to say it every time. <laughs> every time. Um, well, when you guys are going to watch this video, it's uh, immediately after the 4th of July. So I hope you all had a fun time celebrating the independence of our country. Hopefully um, nobody blew their hands off. And if you did... <laughs> Sorry. Best wishes. <laughs> that sucks, dude. All right. But anyways, today we are going to kind of roll off of, it, it is a little bit comparable to last week's topic, but today what we're going to be talking about is the, well, just the life and uh, the ups and downs or the wave, as we call it, of a uh, salesman, right? So what we want to dive into here is, you know, how do you keep yourself mentally fit enough to be able to handle the job of a salesman? Um, one of the hardest things, and this is, you know, we talk about this repeatedly in trainings with our sales personnel and, you know, both Ryan and myself are active in the field sales people and we probably always will be. Um, but it's, it's understanding, understanding the power of numbers, right? Utilizing your conversion ratios, your metrics, and also, you know, the no's are a good indicator of when you're get to your next yes, which is kind of counter counterintuitive to the, the standard human, mm -hmm. which is why a lot of people try their hand in sales and fall flat on their face right at the beginning because they think they're going to be all, you know, automatically good at it. Um, and the, But the other part of it is the fact that you don't have the power of the pen, right? So there's not really something tangible that happens. I remember I talked about this a little bit in one of the other episodes about just how much mental energy um, it takes to be a good and effective communicator in a sales world, how many conversations you have to have, how on point you have to be, so on and so forth. And I mentioned, you know, my first day in business to business sales, we did like a 10 hour shift and I fell asleep at my, uh, <laughs> my girlfriend at the time's dinner table, eating dinner with her parents yeah. and how, you know, how fun that was. But, you know, coming from somebody, I, I had done labor jobs up to that point and that's incredibly taxing, you know? incredibly white person out in the sun getting beat down you know shoveling things carrying you know 20 30 40 pound pieces of equipment around for 10 to 12 hours a day sweating your ass off you know, that has a different feeling when the day's over than the day of a salesperson because you get to see in front of you exactly the work that you put into it you know you're working with your hands you're moving the earth you're doing whatever it is that you're doing you get to see your progress day after day after day so there's there's some kind of, I don't know what the term would be to that, but it makes you feel good. Yeah, gratification. It makes you feel good. As a salesperson, you know, it's very gratifying when you land a sale, but there's a lot of time in between, yep. right? So um, we're going to be talking about riding those waves, getting pitted. <laughs> so pitted, so bro. Pitted. And uh, how to, you know, achieve a life of success in um sales position so ryan where do you want to start because we have a number of good ideas but i don't know which which area we wanted to start on i i think that like i don't know i think we should start with the 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 gaps in 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 or the valleys right and how to um low tide 
how to um you know what what skills and stuff do you use what what have you heard other people use with success um it part of this topic is hard for me mm -hmm. because i i don't mentally struggle too much in low spells mm -hmm. because for me it's it's a one it's a mindset thing mm -hmm. right but two it's it's um they're they're less frequent obviously now i mean i'm 16 years into selling things um products or services more or less but <clears throat> There's less emotional uh, peaks and valleys, I guess, because it for me it's more of a show up, do what you're supposed to do, and the results will come. <laughs> so the solution to all of life's problems, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> Shia LaBeouf, do it. Yeah. Well, no, but I, I it's think an acquired is an acquired trait. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So like, but I mean, I've gone through the the. <sighs> emotional valleys of you know especially when you work with somebody a customer for a long period of time and then it doesn't come to fruition mm -hmm. i mean i've i've definitely been in the space i don't know 10 years ago five years ago where you question your existence right it's right. like am i good at anything right what am i doing here mm -hmm. should i do something else mm -hmm. um but <clears throat> I don't look at um, the way that the way that I view KPIs is very different than I think most salesmen. Mm -hmm. They look at them in a very day day by day, week by week, month by month basis, and I look at it on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. So um, I look at milestones that are much grander to hit. I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. So, like, I know that <clears throat> if I hit this number, then I'm achieving my baseline. If I hit this number, I'm doing better than my baseline. If I hit this number, then I'm far exceeding my baseline, mm -hmm. right? And, um, but I, I think that, I mean, I, I've, I've had this conversation with so many people, especially in the last six months, of the... The low point, the trials, right? The the days where you don't necessarily get a yes and you stack no's. And um, I guess you could say that I look at a lot of that as like a glass half full. Mm -hmm. um, same as you, I think, is that like, you know, the the doorway to the yes is just through more no's. Right. Um, well, that's a common, common saying in sales organizations yeah. is, you know, that the person with the highest number of yeses also has the highest number of no's. Right. right? Always. Far, like far and away, their numbers, you know, the, regardless of how much volume they're producing, they have mm. spoken to more people and they've been denied and told no right. more than anybody else. And yet they're still pushing. They're still going. They still have the eye of the tiger, whatever you want to call it. Right. right? So, um, okay. So maybe we talk about, well, okay, so this is an acquired trait. Mm-hmm. Something. Let's talk, let's talk about early phases. Then let's talk about building a pipeline and mm -hmm. how to make it through. Because building a pipeline for those of you that aren't in the sales world um, is a really. Let's just say it's a very high stress time of your job. Right? You might have been great in one sales field, but then you try something different, and all of a sudden you have no pipeline. Mm -hmm. Right? You have you have no contacts. You have no relationships. You have nothing to work off of. It's all just going to be up to. How much time are you willing to put in to find those contacts, those relationships, those yeses, right? Um, and in those, those in those low times, in that building phase, a lot of times few people fall into the category of what we would call a starving salesperson, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a starving salesperson is not only a risk to themselves, but they are a risk to the organization because they tend to bite off more than they can chew, promise more things than they can deliver, and say yes to things they should not say yes to. You do some weird shit when you're desperate. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> right? And so um, what types of tools and tricks 
that you've learned can we be can we apply to that phase of, of selling? I well, I think for me, I'm my brain is very um, statistically oriented, and I'm extremely goal oriented. So I know that if I have a, you know, if 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 I was in a position where somebody was leading me, and they told me that I needed to get five thousand no's to be successful, then my purpose would be to get five thousand no's, mm-hmm. right? I wouldn't worry about the yeses. Transparently, if that was my direction that was given to me, then that's what I would do, right? I would focus on the nose, right? So um, I think that <clears throat> it's one of the things that I put a lot of focus on with guys here when they're frustrated. Um, but I, I think that it's it's – it's challenging because like my head goes to, <laughs> it always goes to the head. Like you just, you're just not trying hard enough. Mm-hmm. Right. But there's, there's an element of it for me that, uh, when I was taught sales early on, um, when I got into sales, I was apprehensive because I thought and felt that the sales dynamic was dirty right? Which I think a lot of people do. They just think that, you know, oh, you're in sales. So, (laughs) right. Um, But I had a really interesting conversation. This was actually with Alex and he, I was, when I owned my gym, the type of training that we did was very unique to the area. We had an extremely well-proven track record with athletes, getting them from high school to scholarship level sports in college and then from that to pro contracts, et cetera, et cetera. And all I based everything on was word of mouth, right? Referrals. And he was like, he, he said to me, he's like, so how, how do you expect to grow? And I was like, well, I've grown with referrals. He's like, how do you expect to exponentially grow? And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't, I guess. Right. And he was like, well, have you ever thought about selling what you do? And I was like, no, it, I'm already offering this level of service. I shouldn't have to sell it. Mm-hmm. And he laughed on the phone. <laughs> and he was like, uh, that, that's what I forget what he said exactly. But he's, he's basically like, that's the worst way to think about anything. Mm-hmm. Right. But he said to me, I, I said, I don't like the sales style of things because to me it feels dirty. I feel like I'm trying to convince somebody that they're, to do something that they don't want to do. He goes, no, that's manipulation. Mm -hmm. He goes, what if you just looked at sales as helping somebody with making a decision that they need to make? And I was like, I could bite, bite on that, chew on that a little bit more. Mindset shift. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he, he then asked me a question that really fired me up is he said, so what you're telling me is that there's eight gyms at the time. There was eight gyms locally right? Within 15 miles of my gym. He said, so what, what you're telling me is you'd rather them go there than your gym. And I was like, no, absolutely not. And he goes, but they have salesmen. (laughs) And I was like, okay. And he goes, so what if you just sat people down and talked to them about why their experience with you would be that much better? Why the results they got would be that much better. Do you believe that? to be true. And I said, absolutely. And he said, then just talk about that. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that's sales. And I was like, okay. So what the lesson that I picked up on, I think 10 years later from that was like, he, he, I do firmly believe in, it's really hard to sell something you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Right. I stand by that wholeheartedly, but what he did is he shifted my mindset of pitching to relating. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. right? It's like, you have a problem. I'm the best solution for that problem or whatever service I have is the best solution to that problem. then he said, let's just attack your quote unquote sales that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I remember we did like online appointment setting for sales meetings and we did them in a group fashion. And the first one I had, uh, I think 26 people show up to, 
and three people signed up. And I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Like, this is ridiculous. Right. And I called him and I was like, this is, he was like, well, talk to me about what you said. Talk to him about what I said. He made some tweaks here and there. The next group that came in was 33 and I think 11 signed up. And then, um, subsequently the proceeding, it was 18 days that we ran these meetings. I think I signed up like 51 people out of, I think it was like 275 people that came in. So not a great average in my opinion, but, um, the second time that I ran the same kind of blitz, I changed my mindset around the fact of, um, but at the time I didn't realize was that based on my inexperience, I expected them to say no. Mm-hmm. And that's how I pitched, mm-hmm. right? Was like, what, what, you, you with were, what? You were assumptive, but you were right. assumptive in the negative. Assumptive in the negative, which to me, like I, I was just talking to one of our salesmen about this yesterday. I was like, I presented to them with a shitty attitude, right? right? Mm-hmm. Rather than being conv- convincing and and having conviction and being passionate and positive and, and showing I can have an impact on your life. I showed them something different than that, not necessarily opposite, but just different than that. My energy appeared to be off, right? The second time that I ran the same kind of, uh, I guess you could say advertising blitz. Um, I had 214 people come in for sales meetings and we signed up 181. <clears throat> and the only difference genuinely was the fact that I believed I could. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of really leads to, there's a number of trainings that have had a similar theme to them, but they all, it all boils down to the, the, the belief triad or the belief mm-hmm. triangle, which is essentially you can be good at your, whatever it is, the product or service that you're trying to sell. You can be good in your position as the salesperson or the conduit to the, you know, to the, result um the three beliefs are belief in yourself Mm -hmm. belief in your process and then belief in your product right right so a lot of the times when people are introductory salespeople, if they have experience they do believe in themselves so they can fight through the chaos for a little while so they've got one then they learn the process Mm -hmm. and they get to experience the product all the way along so it does take some time to be able to become that trifecta so Mm -hmm. to speak but you know, you only have one or you have two, you're lacking, right? And if you're a salesperson and you can never get to the third one, you're never going to reach your peak, right? So as a organizational head or as a person that owns the business or runs the business or is ex- executor of the business or whatever, your goal for to be able to retain salespeople is to create incredible efficiencies so the process is perfect and you can deliver on the deliverables and then create a product that's so sound and, and, and worthy of, of praise that people want to go and want to sell it. You want to believe in it. Right? right. But also to relate back to what the first thing that you said um, about the, your, you, your opposition to selling, I felt the exact same way. Mm-hmm. I have in my whole life. I've never like on TV, the salespeople always, you know, growing up in the nineties, the salespeople are always slicked hair. Oh yeah. You know, lion, you know, yeah. dirty scoundrels, yeah. right? All of them, right? And that's nine, the, the, nine dollar button up shirts, right? And that, and that's and they're they're sweaty and they're anxious and they're like, you know what I mean? Like they, they're, <laughs> yeah. but sales sales is a necessity. Like, yeah. So if you talk about the boat theory, like in big conferences and stuff, you talk about the boat theory, your entire business is sitting on a boat, right? And it starts to sink. You don't have any more cargo to push off. Who do you push over first, right? Who are you going to get rid of? Um, and still be able to get your ship to its destination, right? right? Um, and the last people that you ever push off is the salesperson, right? And that and that goes further and further and further down the rabbit hole. But but like, there's millions and millions of ideas that people have developed in in their lifespan, or you know, just in general, patents that never go anywhere, so on and so forth. Specifically because they don't have the conduit of the salesperson to get it to their, you know their market, whatever right. market that it is, whatever the service or good or whatever is, um, it's because that person, the connecting point is not there. So you have to instill the belief. You have to, you have to live it. You have to breathe it. You have to move with it. And it takes some time to be able to actually flow. Yeah. With that, right. And so, you know, as a organizational heads that we sit in, 
you know, it's whenever there's sales problems or turnover problems, the things that we're thinking about, it's not necessarily just are they good enough. Their resume showed it. Their personality shows it. It's like, uh uh-oh, our procedure isn't good enough. Our process isn't good enough. Or maybe our product just isn't good enough yet. Yet. Right. Let's focus on that. Right. Right. So, yeah, that's that's one thing. When I started uh, working in sales, um, luckily enough, the first job that I ever, like the first one I ever took that was like a real paying sales job because I had done some other things in sales beforehand, but it was simple stuff that every, you know, high schooler does, which is like, you know, I went out and knocked doors and mowed grass and, you know, or I sold raffle tickets for my baseball team or whatever else, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, But like a real job where it was compensated, luckily enough, I wasn't compensated specifically on the sale at that point in time. There was a training phase, right? So I got to learn without the the added pressure. Right. right? Um, but anyways, yeah, so my – but we've talked about this on the, on, the, on the podcast before. Both you and I are very similar, which is – I can't say, you know, every there's, – there's salespeople from all necks of the woods, right? Some people are incredibly gifted with gap yeah. you know they just are salespeople from the day that they're born and their parents even know it you know mm-hmm. um and then there are people like you and i where we have to see the the magic of the sale in front of us for us to believe in it right um but i was so uncomfortable doing this that it was very in my mind it was very short term but then i watched one person who to this day i still feel is the best salesperson i've ever said i've ever seen no no disrespect to you dan me whoever it's it's Specifically, this person was like a wizard Mm -hmm. when he spoke to people, right? He got people to say yes to him within moments of meeting him. And he was his weirdest guy. (laughs) You know, like he's he's very, when he opens up to you, he's a pretty normal guy, very motivated. But like, it was weird. It was odd how people are just like, yes, okay. Right. I'll do exactly what you say right now. I believe everything you're saying, right? I was like, you need to teach me. (laughs) Um, So Nolan, wherever you are. You're still the man, but um, either way, it's like <laughs> I feel like the trials and tribulations, the wave that waves that come from the sales field. Um, I think that the 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 most important thing for a salesperson who or aspiring salesperson, somebody who wants to get into this to understand, is you can't you can't have short term thinking. Never. Short term thinking is going to be the bane of your existence. You're not going to last long, right? How many friends or family members do you have that have started an MLM? Right? Yeah. They immediately contact you. You haven't heard from them in three years, but they contact you and say, I was thinking about you. I've got this product. Got this I want. idea. I want you to show up to my house and I've got cookies and coffee. Yeah. You know, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? And they're super motivated about it for about as long as they were sold for by whoever gave yep. it to them. And then they find out you have to put in repetition and lots of it and especially lots, within mlm not just not just practice but perfect practice like yep. you have to do what you did with alex which is like okay we test trialed this tell me the results tell me about your pitch what exactly here's what i'm gathering from your pitch maybe if we tweak this and this and you try again and you just increase small you know one percent increase is is actually a big deal right in the Huge. world of, in the world of sales and, and just in everything in general <laughs> 1% increase or 1%, you know, more successful mm-hmm. every day, you know, you're, you're a powerhouse after two, three, four years. Yeah. You're just absolutely dynamite. Right? Yeah. Anybody can learn this stuff. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're introverted, extroverted. You've never spoken to anybody because you lived under a rock your entire life. You can learn how to do this, but you have to think about it. And let's not think about right now. Right. Let's think about where you want to get to and then analyze every single step as you get there. So it, it's funny because your Nolan is is like Alex to me. I remember when I met him on the phone for the first time. He um, he's pitching me more or less, right? And at this time, I think I'm twenty. Let's see, I was twenty four, right? And um, my gym was successful, but it it was successful in the sense that it. At this time, it wasn't losing money, right? but I was literally just zeroing out every month, right? I wasn't really making any money. I was working, I don't know, 75, 80 hours a week, mm-hmm. right? And I would always make my payroll, but I would never have anything left over. I could pay my bills at home, but 
I, it, it was relatively miserable, right? You weren't living the entrepreneurial dream right. yet. Right. But I, I remember <laughs> he says to me, he goes, so here's the deal. You're going to ACH me this much money and I'm going to 10X it in 21 days. And I was like, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I stayed on the phone with him. I think our first phone call ever was like 45 minutes, right? And um, I told him like probably seven or eight times in that phone call. I was like, dude, you're not selling me. I'm not doing this. Like I literally have like 2,800 bucks in my bank account. Mm -hmm. And I have my rent, my gym's rent, payroll, all these things coming out in the next 10 days. And I know I have these membership dues coming to me and it's just going to zero out. I'm not taking that risk. Right. By the end of the phone call, he had my ACH routing number and he had all the money in my bank account. Right. <laughs> And, um, he, he, in 26 days, he 31 X my money. Wow. So, but I told him, I think it was like a week after that first phone call. I said, because not one time during that phone call, did I feel like I was being lied to, manipulated, persuaded, nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, I was like, I need you to teach me what you just did to me. And he was like, oh, that's the easy part. I was like, didn't fucking seem easy to me. <laughs> I mean, I, bas I blatantly just told you no like eight times, right? And he goes, but you said yes, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, that's true. But it, for me, it was like um, that was a big wake-up call for me, mm -hmm. right? Because I was like, I need his skill set, mm -hmm. not just with sales, but just like – his ability to relate, mm -hmm. his ability to communicate, his ability to attack all of my objections. That, that's exactly how I felt about right. my time with Nolan. I didn't ever intend to stay in sales. Right. I mean, at that point in time, all I was doing was waiting for my acceptance letter to dental school. Right. Like, and we've yeah. we've shared <laughs> stories like of you watching him sell yeah. or listening to him sell and me with – and I used to just be like – yeah, it's it's just like it's like it's literally like magic in front of your eyes, right? right? I was I would that's that's the thing enthralled. too with him. It was like I just want to be able to connect with another human this way. Right. It's like I see how valuable this can be. And we talk about this with salespeople in here all the time. It's like I know for certain that nobody woke up one day and said, I want to work for Pride Roofing and Construction for the rest of my life, right? That's exactly what I want to do. Roofing sales is my jam. This is, this is me written all over. I know that. But the time that you spend here and the repetitions that you put in, you know, is like it can it can just form you and shape you into something just so much more powerful. Your resume after you leave a sales job, any sales job that that's worth its weight anyway, right? Mm -hmm. With good mentors and good processes and stuff. You know, if you if you put some time into it, you're universally just more accepted right. by by humans, by employers, by whatever. You can walk in and sell yourself to anybody. Right. Right. And that's a big deal. So I, I'm I'm curious to know like what's your because I've got a I've got a example that I bring up a lot in training with the sales guys, specifically around what I refer to as just sample sizes. But um what's your like if you have a number or amount of time, whatever it is, what's your longest drought? Sales wise? Mm-hmm. Or like, what's your largest number of concurrent no's? Um, actually, so with the amount of time I spent selling in the fitness world, um, and with with the fitness world, I mean, people come to you mm -hmm. and they're intending to sell, or I mean, to buy something, right? right? So right. like, your job is to position them for the best outcome for not only them but for the organization, right? right. So like. There wasn't a lot of dry spells with my first job. <laughs> my biggest dry spell actually happened when I worked for a different gym company. It was when I was working. Um, so I had transferred. I got a promotion. Um, within like a month, you know, I went from being a, a standard uh, membership and PT sales re representative to being the assistant manager of a gym on the other side of Denver. Got it. Right? I, it took me three full weeks to sell my first personal training package. And it was specifically because of the cultural differences from one gym to the next. Right. That was really difficult for me because the people on, you know, where the first gym, 
you know, the uh, um, the average household income in this area of town was higher. Um, the, you know, if you just looked at the general population, there was more people who were fitness conscious just in general in that area. You moved over to this spot in Aurora. It wasn't Southland's Aurora. It was like in the heat of like the, you know, the, I guess the lowest income area of Aurora. And um, it was it was incredibly difficult to, to, to transition um, to what they need to hear. I had whole, to try whole different ev- avatar. every single pitch. Every one of them I've ever learned, I had to create more. I had to ask questions. I had to go around. And I felt like I was... I, th- I felt like I was a failure to the bosses that believed in me that pushed me over to the other gym. Mm-hmm. I was like, please don't fire me. I'm trying to, my damnedest to figure this out, <laughs> you know? Um, and, it, and all it took was, uh, with it, honestly, it wasn't a, ch- a pitch change. It was de- a demeanor change, mm-hmm. right? A lot of it had to do with I needed to sh- lower my shoulders a little bit. I needed to stand less peacocked and less like I've got this all together and more of like, hey, bro, let's hang out for a little bit. Let's have a conversation about our lives, right? And it really t- flipped a switch for me because I had, I had been doing, you know, my my methodology before that was like exactly what we talked about at the beginning. It's like how many no's do I need? Like I'm I'm a ten no guy. I need ten no's. So the eleventh one is a yes. So let's just keep bam 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 bam. At that point, that's when I started developing relational sales. Right? Let me learn a little bit about you. Let's be friends after this is over. Why don't you come up and talk to me at the desk afterwards? Tell me about your things. If I don't see in here, I'm going to give you a phone call because I actually want you to achieve this, that kind of stuff, right? right? It became more transformational than transactional, I think is the terms that we like to use around here. And um, from that day forward, I went straight back to the same, you know, that that three-week dry spell. um, I went straight back to where I was, the number one salespeople in the entire country for that organization. Um, it just took as much as it's learning a new, a new script. Right. So, so uh, three, three and a half weeks? About three and a half weeks. Yeah, three, three and a half weeks. How was your mindset? I felt like I was the, I was the biggest loser of all time. I was like, I have been telling myself a lie for the last, you know, seven years, six, you know, eight years, whatever. I was like, I am a. I'm wearing a mask. I am nothing like, you know, it was like, it was destroying me. And that's one of the hardest parts as a salesperson is not, you know, not misconstruing your personal worth with right. your volume you're producing. Right. right. Was the decision to change the demeanor mm-hmm. self-imposed or did somebody recommend that? Honestly, I kind of, I kind of gave up. Right. I kind of <laughs> literally not like, not like in a sense, like I wasn't going to show up and do, and do my work, but it was like, yeah. I just accepted, I'm never going to sell anything here. Well, you, you, your body language reflected your internal dialogue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and evidently that's mm-hmm. what they wanted to see. They right. wanted to see somebody who wasn't just pushing this potion of, uh, you know, fitness is going to change your life. It was like, I had to still believe that I did still definitely believe that, but it, I, I, I changed it to more of like, here's why I love this so much. And mm-hmm. here's why I think you're going to be invested in this. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, w- when I talk about sample sizes, right, I, um, there's a, a, we were, we were running a marketing program for um, Jim Launch a long time ago. And we we're talking to one of our business mentors and, He's like, hey, I, I was just like, we sent out a bunch of these flyers. Mm-hmm. Didn't really get much response, so I just don't think it's really worth it. The guy was like, how many did you send? It was like 5,000. And he goes, but you can't even look at metrics until you send 100,000. Mm-hmm. It's like, it doesn't even matter. Like Your sample size is too small. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that... And it's a difficult one for new people in sales, but like when they're like, ah, I'm just, I don't think I'm good at this or this. I just don't know if this is for me or this is harder than I thought, mm-hmm. or um, it's, this is, which, which to me just all boils down to this requires more work than I was willing to put in and, or was under the impression that I had to give. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which I think is a generational, generational problem, but <laughs> 
see it a lot more with you yeah. guys. Yeah. But um, I'll, I'll talk to him and I'll be like, okay, so how many interactions have we had? Because we go off of, uh, obviously, for a lot of listeners here, we do, especially after storms, we do a lot of sales where we go door to door, right? And there's a lot of people that focus their effort on, well, I knocked X amount of doors today. I'm like that metric to me doesn't really matter, mm-hmm. right? How many interactions did you have today? Mm-hmm. Like how many people did you have conversation with? Mm-hmm. If, if that conversation is 15 seconds or 15 minutes, I don't care. How many people did you have conversation with? They're like five. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. So what you're telling me mm-hmm. is that if I had five people come into the office, look at you and say, you're not good at this. Mm-hmm. Five times in a row. You would just believe them? <laughs> like you're just five people that have no idea who you are. Mm-hmm. They have no, no information about any past success, what you've done with your life, your story, nothing. Mm-hmm. You're just going to say, I'm just not good at this. You're right. <laughs> and, and you're going to tell them fair enough. Mm-hmm. I quit. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm like, so if we take a sample size of we'll say 50, Mm -hmm. right. And you have a success rate of 10% when you're new, it's actually not bad. Yeah. The the national average for sales close ratio is like, it's like 15%. It's a little, yeah, it's, it's a little over 10%. But like, so I, I look at like, I tell people, I want you to have, 250 interactions before you make a judgment call Mm -hmm. of this is, this is good for me or bad for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I am good at this or I am bad at this. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and of those interactions, I want you to have somebody there that is better than you at this or more experienced for at least half of them Mm -hmm. so that we can see, are you good at this or are you not good at this? Where can we help you? Mm -hmm. Where can we train you up? Right. But to, I see it, and not not just in this industry, but I just see it in so many places in sales in general where it's like, if you're a true dedicated sales professional, Mm -hmm. you should be successful anywhere Mm -hmm. if you're selling, period, right? You should should be. Might might be an on-ramp to your success, but regardless, you should be able to take light fire pretty quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. The person I always think of, uh, I don't know if you remember, he came in here uh, for a little while, Joey, mm-hmm. right? And in our interview, he was like, tell me five things about what we're selling and I'll be your top salesman, mm-hmm. right? And I remember, and I, I'm still in contact with him. He actually lives a couple streets over from me, but um, that's an unequivocal level of confidence mm-hmm. to just be like, I don't really give a shit what it is. Tell me five things about it, I'll sell it. Right. But he has what I would say is a graduated mentality of understanding. There's going to be quite a bit of speed bumps along the way Mm -hmm. where I learn this, whatever this is, this process, product, whatever. And my time that I spent with him out in the field was very eye opening to me of how inquisitive he was. Mm -hmm. Right. Because in his interview, I was like, damn, this guy's cocky. When we went out in the field, he showed zero arrogance. He was like, just teach me everything you know about it, mm-hmm. right? Teach me the process. Teach me what you do. I want to learn from you, and then I'm going to refine it, and I'm going to be the best at it. And I was like, okay, great. There was not one statement that I ever heard from his mouth that was like, this is too hard. Mm-hmm. Or I don't, I don't want to continue having interactions where I get told no. Mm-hmm. Never. It was, to me, that's what I would say is a graduated salesman, right? So I think that the, what what do you, what do you think? I think I never had the mindset, I guess, my first time that I really face planted in sales. um, I never, like the time I went back to Alex, I never was like, I can't do this. I literally just said, what do I need to do to do better? Mm -hmm. Right. Cause that, and I don't know if that's an ingrained mindset. I think part of that has to do with my recovery, but like 
I'm, it's never been in my thought process to just be like, nah, I'm not good at this. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't exist for me. Um, I'm very similar. Um, I've never thought that I couldn't do it. Right. In fact, I have an overwhelming sense of optimism towards my ability to do just about anything. Right. The only thing that's different is the things that I'm not good at are the things that don't intrigue me. Right. They're the ones I don't want to put the time into. Right. It's like, why? Me too. Why do I want to put that energy into that? It's not It's not my cup of tea. Right. But sales for me was always something I wanted to put time into. I always wanted to dedicate time to hone in on the craft because it was, I saw it to be valuable, but I also saw it as a competition. Mm-hmm. And I love that about sales. It's like, it, it doesn't need to be that you and the other guys on the team are, you know, at each other's throats, cutting each other's, you know, legs out from under them. That's not the type of competition I'm talking about, but it's like, it feels like a sport. Mm-hmm. Everything about it feels like a sport. You know, you're putting in practice and repetition. You're showing up to the game. You're preparing for the game. You know, you win. Sometimes you lose sometimes. And you win, you learn a lot from the losses, right? Like, it's like if you're, if you're direct enough with your clients and they say no to you, they're going to give you literally a written script on what it is that threw them off. And it's, if you're smart enough to actually absorb that mm-hmm. and either avoid or add, you're always going to get better every single day. It's like a professional salesperson is somebody who has spent the same amount of times honing in on sales as, as a professional baseball player did to get onto the mound in the big leagues. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I see it very differently than other people do, which is why, you know, I've never had like, I can't do this. Um, But I have always had the, I'm not where I want to be yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go find out how to get there. Right. You're a bit a little bit uh, obsessive in nature, like me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do anything obsessive when you were learning sales, uh, or maybe just more green to get better faster? Uh-huh. What'd you do? Uh, two nerdy things. Um, first was I bought every sales book that Barnes and Noble had on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them. And I read them, <laughs> underlined them, highlighted them, you know. Um, and then the other thing that I started doing was I kept track of my stats. I started, I just took a notebook with me and I, I started documenting interactions. Um, I started documenting feedback. I mm-hmm. started documenting everything that I possibly could. And then I'd review those things at the end of the day. And I'd start to be like, okay, I'm going to change this. And then I also documented where I was working, what types of, because I was doing business to business sales mm-hmm. in the first for, well, it was business to business first. And then it was inside the gym after you've opened the gym. And that was the way it went for opening all the different gyms and whatever. But it was like, okay, these types of businesses, I had a bad interaction with this type of business at this time of the week. So I'm going to try it at a different time of the week. Right. Because, well, maybe it makes sense that you don't go into a bank on a Monday morning or a Friday night when everybody's paid and nobody can talk to you. Right. Like, you know, let's start to use some strategy here. So I started documenting my statistics and writing feedback, journaling. It's like a field journal, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I just read and review it, read and review it. And then I'd look at that the the night of and the morning before I started again. And then I just go back out, do it again, read and review, read and review over and over and over and over and over. So So it's it's. It's funny you say that because when we did almost the same exact thing and we didn't know each other at that time, right? But like, so, um, I don't know if, I think you remember this from, I showed you, uh, probably two and a half, three years ago when, when I came on to pride that those old lead sheets I had, right. That I would color code them. Mm -hmm. So in those lead sheets, there were four tabs, right. And one of the tabs was objections. Right. And I would, if I had a sales meeting where the outcome was negative, Mm -hmm. right. Uh, I would list the objection Mm -hmm. that the customer gave me that predicated the ending of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would just write customer name, length of interaction. So the time that we talked and then main objection. Mm -hmm. Right. And I did that, and I think in in that sheet, I have like 750 or something of those, right? Over the time I was 24 to 30. And I would then color code them based on objection. 
the more colors I had of more objections, the more I would study that objection, right? And then it becomes, and I've told this to the salespeople, I'm like, that work for us, I'm like, it becomes kind of a game of whack-a-mole because you get really good at handling this objection and then you kind of forget how to handle some of these other objections. And then it's, it's but it's just a constant game of refining, right? Chris and I, uh, ex business our partner and I, we used to talk about it as the mental Rolodex. Right. So like w- with that field journal, what I initially did was the objection that I found that I just couldn't, I didn't have an answer to or I gave the wrong answer to. Mm-hmm. I would create, like I would put three different answers to that question on there. And then I kind of study those answers and I try them out one by one. Yep. And I test which one was more, you know, more successful. Right. And then I'd keep that one. But I wouldn't have to keep going back to it because once I found the successful one, it went, I just left it in my mental Rolodex, right? Yep. I tried it four or five times. I remember it. It's good to go. And so it's, what's interesting, and then I, that sports analogy, the sales sports analogy is like, you know, it's like a football game. If you're on your end zone, right, and you got to make it 100 yards to the other end zone, you're not just going to run across the field. Right. Right. There's defensive tackles and there's linebackers and there's safeties. You know, there's all different layers of the defense. And you have to try this move at this area. You've got to, you know, you're close to the sideline. You've got to move this way. And an athlete knows that because they've practiced it. It's the same thing. It's like, okay, I'm running here. I've got to pivot. I've got to go this way. Okay, I hit this objection. Okay, spin move, bam. You know, that that's that's how I look at just the world of sales um, because it's – it is a game. Mm-hmm. It is a game. I mean, it's you're, you're playing with your livelihood because you got to pay your bills. But at the same time, if you become good enough at it, you can run over any defense. It's funny. Like, <clears throat> I was saying this um, probably a month or two ago in a, you know, one of the settings where people were disgruntled. Mm-hmm. And I was explaining, like, the your livelihood is attached to this. So if you had to, if somebody said, listen, your livelihood for the next year is attached to you deconstructing this vehicle to all of its parts, Mm -hmm. you can use whatever resources you want. And you just started going for it with nothing, Mm -hmm. right? Your chance of success is incredibly low. Right. Because you don't know about the vehicle right now. I, I clearly said anything is at your disposal, right? The manual videos, whatever, right? Any tools you want. But if I'm the one saying you need to take this car apart in a year and I'll make sure that you are taken care of financially for that year for your livelihood. Right. I'm I'm not going to help. Right. But I'm giving you the option to use whatever necessities you need to to do it. And you choose not to. Mm -hmm. That's on you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the people that choose not to are the ones who don't actually burn the boats. Right. They're always the ones that don't burn the boats. Like they have, you know, I was actually mentioned this about one of the guys on the team a couple of weeks ago that I was worried he was straddling the fence. Right. And talking about splinters in your ass. It's like it's a comfortable place to be. But it's like it's clear that both feet are not in. Right. It's very clear. Right. And it's like, so every time there's a no, right, and it demotivates you, you know, and you're not actually being obsessive about it, you start to lean to the other side of the fence. Like, right. Let's go back to what was easier the last time before I came here. Right. Then the, the term burning the boats. I mean, back when I started doing sales, YouTube wasn't as powerful as it is right, right. now. Like you could, you could literally become a great salesperson off of YouTube guidance. Alone. Just yeah. all you got to do is type in, sales pitches, objection, rebuttal, blah, blah, blah. And you can watch countless hours of people showing you the tips, you know, and the tricks that they've used in their lives and the things that are successful. We didn't have that at that point in time. But what I did understand is that if I wanted to be good at it, I had to commit to the idea that I'm not going back. Right. It was as as simple as that. It's like if if I have no ability to get back to the boat that brought me to this island, Right, and I have to fight this army of people. Well, I'm going to find a, a weapon. Right, I'm going to sharpen that shit. I'm going to find I'm a way. Go fight. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that that's what I mean. I I kind of had, and it was a kind of a, a candid conversation with them about that. I was like, listen, if if 
if I'm going to hear frustrations about like, this is how I make a living Mm -hmm. act like it. Right. Right. And they were like, I was like, how many of you guys have, let's say you knock 200 doors in three days. How many times in that time are you changing your pitch? Right. How many times do you change your tone? How many change? How many times do you change the rate of speech, mm-hmm. right? Or your body language? Mm-hmm. Do we completely shift what we're saying in the script? Mm-hmm. Do we like? And you know, when I when I hear answers, whether it's here or previous jobs, et cetera, and they're like, "No, not really." I'm like, "Then you just don't care." Mm-hmm. To me, right? I'm like, nobody asked me, "Hey, will you track all these objections and get better?" Yeah, I was like, "No, that was like." I don't feel like I'm as good at this as I can be. What's a really easy way for me to get better at this on my own? Let's just track these things. And these are the things that I struggle with. Let me get better at those things. Exactly. It's like, it doesn't make any sense if you can't in, in a, put it back to sports, right? If your swing, you can't hit the ball for shit, but you just keep swinging the same way. Are you going to get better at hitting? Or you just keep talking about how you can't hit the ball. <laughs> I just say, oh, man, life is so hard because, you know, I can't hit a ball. You know, like it's like, right. then, yeah, sure, go try another sport. Obviously, right. you don't have the obs- obsession enough to be good at the one sport that you're in right now. So go try another one. I hope that maybe you change that mindset. Right. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's it does take a it takes a it, it takes firm belief in self to be a good salesperson. It takes um, removing the option of retreat. Always, right? You cannot have backup plans. It's like, understand as a salesperson, there's always a backup plan. Mm -hmm. If you're good at it, you're going to get hired somewhere else, right? Right? So, like, the fact that you have burned the boats and you became obsessive only makes you more hireable because you're getting better, right? right? And then on top of that, you have to do, you have to do the internal work. Right. You have to commit to actually practicing things. You have to commit to, you know, they say, you know, the only thing that people see in a, in a like in a sports world is the team under the lights. But how many hours have they spent in the dark? Right. Right. It's like, you know, the, the take a football player. It's like how many gym hours did they spend that week? Right. How many times did they work out per day? How honed in was their actual training regimen? Right. right. It wasn't just they were throwing weights around for the sake of it. How much was dialed into the exact job that they needed to do? Did they show up to practice? Did they perform in practice? Were they blaming other people for their errors in practice? Or were they creating camaraderie and they were taking accountability? Were they doing every single one of those things when they show up on the field and they play? The ones that are on the on the field actually performing, they earned that shit. Right. Right. And it wasn't because the coaches, you know, just you know, lined them up for them. It's like, right. no, they earned it. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's I mean it's just funny that principle and how it genuinely applies to everything, mm-hmm. right? Like I was I was at uh, I was telling Joe this story the other night at uh, at my house. I was at the gym <clears throat> like four or five months ago, and um, I was doing upright rows, mm-hmm. and I was doing them with two twenty five, mm-hmm. and this kid, I and I could see him, which it doesn't. It doesn't bother me at all. I actually kind of enjoy it because it opens up the the opportunity for conversation mm-hmm. when I can see someone like, whoa, <laughs> right? I never approach them. I always just let them approach me. But in the, I was changing in the locker room afterwards, and he goes, excuse me, bro. And I, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect intro. <laughs> excuse me, bro. Yeah, he's 19, <laughs> right? I was like, what's up, dude? And he was like, how did you get so strong? And I was like, you want the truth? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah. I was like, I did the same thing every day for 14 years. It's funny you say that. You know who Ron Waterman is? Mm -hmm. Um, The H2O man? Yeah. Uh, He was one of his son, Justin Waterman, was on my wrestling team um, when I was wrestling for Greeley Metro. It was Uh before middle school, high school, or whatever. But, you know, Ron Waterman was very much Greeley's celebrity. Right. right? And he was one of my coaches. And my dad became a little bit of a friend with him. And I went up to him after um, one of the practices. And I was like, how'd you get so big? You know, and I was just this little kid. And he goes, honestly, I have worked out every day of my life 
since eighth grade. Right. I have not missed a workout. And I was like, so you <laughs> just showed up. And he goes, exactly, kid. Yeah. And I was like, all right, dude. Yeah. You know, and so it, it it's funny because, yeah, and it's like you see a big guy in the gym. It's really easy to have, um, like, because that has tangible evidence to it. You know, like, it's really easy to have an immediate respect for them, mm-hmm. right? Regardless of if there's performance-enhancing drugs involved in that type of stuff, it's like they you could take all the steroids in the world, but if you don't pick the weights up, you're not going to look huge. Right. You're not going to look like that. You're not going to have perfectly shaped everything, you know, yeah. whatever. And so when you see somebody, you know, um, that's kind of my, that's how I, I, I laugh about it now, but that's all I've ever said when somebody comes up to me like, how did you do that? I was yeah. like, I've practiced every day yeah. since I was in eighth grade. Because yeah. that's when I started lifting. I started lifting at the end of my seventh grade year. And it's like, <clears throat> am I the biggest? No. Am I the best? Am I the most powerful? No, I'm not. But I'm a cut above the rest because I right. have not missed the time. Right? Well, it's it's funny because when I told that kid that, he looked at me with like almost like a sense of disappointment. Mm-hmm. Like he was like, oh. oh. So you actually have to put some work in. I was like, yeah, there's no shortcuts for it. <laughs> and he was like, well, how do I, how, how would you suggest I gain like 15, 20 pounds? And I was like, do what I just said, but with eating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he was like, really? I was like, dude, it's really that simple. Mm-hmm. I said, if you're, but it's that simple with everything. Mm-hmm. It's that simple with sale. It's like, how do I get better? Mm-hmm. Like I used to watch when I started here and I shadowed you, mm-hmm. I was like, people, people were like, well, you're lucky you got to shadow Christian. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I am lucky. You're absolutely right. But what you don't understand is that I shadowed him and I obsessively took notes. Right. And I obsessively observed not only what he said, how he said it, body language, approachability, relatability, everything. Mm-hmm. Right. And I took notes and then I was like, these are the things that I saw success with. I'm going to mirror those, mm-hmm. right? And do those things that have provided him with success. And then it led me success. But, like, I look at, like, the gym, anything, cooking, sales, anything, cornhole, right? <laughs> it's just literally, like. like there's some f- fucking phenomenal cornhole players dude, in the world. Competition, I've, baby. I have shamefully watched them on ESPN for longer than I care to admit a few times. Um, but uh, uh, I'm a cornhole connoisseur. Yeah. But um, it, it's it's like the the law of repetition. But I think that there's also something that goes along with that that I've learned, and I'm I. I've observed this from people like, we'll say Alex, for instance, who's a year younger than me. I think his personal net worth now is a quarter billion, right? And by the time he's probably 38, he'll probably be running companies that have a collective net worth of over 2 billion. Mm -hmm. He's the first one to tell you, he's like, I'm not special Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. He said, the thing that I do that's different than you is that I just work harder. That's it. Yeah. Put in put in the time. Right. Well, I think that's um, not to sound so simplistic, but I mean, what's that? The most simplest explanation is generally always the right explanation. Usually, right? And mm-hmm. I can't remember what the Latin mm-hmm. phrase is, but yeah. Either way, it's like if you really boil this stuff down, it's it's as simple as committing to a path, and then putting one foot after the other and not turn around. Right. And I secretly love being in an environment with people that are naturally gifted at that, Mm -hmm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like when I would train, when I was training professionally, like I was around guys that were, I'm very naturally gifted with strength, but these guys were like next level. Mm -hmm. Right. And even in sales, I mean, there's a couple of people here that are very naturally gifted in sales. And it just like, it's, but it's my favorite quote. It was painted with two foot letters around my gym. And it's just hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Exactly. And it's like that That for me, that was like my mantra because I was never inherently talented at anything. 
I, I understood that phrase in a, in a different in a different way when I got to college. And right. It was specifically because like I, I wasn't the, I was definitely not their first recruit. Right. right. Like I was one of their last recruits, to be frank. And when I got there, I was like, man, if only I had the talent that these guys had. You know, you mix that with the work ethic that I have, that would be dynamite. Right. And I realized that in front of me, I was like, look, I could do basically anything. If I'm here and I'm progressing, they are here and they're not progressing. I think that this is the right path mm -hmm. <laughs> for everything. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. you know, the reason I wanted to talk about the, the ebb and flow, the waves, I wanted to dive into this topic was specifically just because of the week that I have been having. Right. So went from Monday uh, dealing with, you know, high level escalations, um, you know, we've done a really good job as a, as a unit to focus on our efficiencies, um, communication time, timeliness, so on and so forth. But there's still, you know, it used to be like every hundred jobs that we would do, about nine or ten of them would have just these kerfuffles that we had to deal with. Kerfuffles. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. That's a great adjective. You know, but uh, now it's down to like one to three. That's a ten point word. Yeah, <laughs> kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. Let's play some Scrabble. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so I went from that, which is is a day that's really difficult because you know you're 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 doing what you say that you're going to do, which is you know you're accountable to them. You fix the problems. You jump in. You put your personal you know like stamp of approval. I will see this dude through completion. But it also draws energy from you. Like it's right. it's kind of a demotivating day because it's like damn, five years later, how are we having this issue? You know. Right. And then went to having the best contract of my year so far the next day. So I'm on top of the world, like, oh, this is the easiest day ever. I had a lot of fun, you know, smiling everywhere. And then today I almost fall off a roof, right? So it's been a way for me. But I want to talk about this particular conversation because, one, I wanted to remind myself, um, you know, the, the simplicity of the sales job, yep. you know, the focal points that I need to have so that this doesn't, you know, ruin me for the weekend with the kids and, come back in a bad mood and that kind of stuff. But also, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's important for the audience to understand that not every day is going to be a good day. And most days won't be. <laughs> Some days are strictly just training. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm just putting repetitions in. If I get 1% better, if I get a half a point, yeah, a half a percentage better. Yeah. I really won today. Right. In the sales world, it is, it's really difficult to keep yourself positive and motivated. But if you're thinking in a future you know, in future state, you're thinking with the abundance mindset and you understand that, you know, it's a st it's statistically impossible for you to come out with nothing if you put in X amount of work. You will find somebody. I've seen the worst salespeople on the planet produce high sales numbers because they were excellent workers. Right. You know what I mean? Like they just, they did not have that gift. They weren't that honed in on any of it yet, but they did the job. Mm -hmm. They met with all the people. They crossed all the boxes. They asked all the questions. At the end of the day, they had more numbers than the guy that you know, self, self, you know, the the self, uh, self, what, 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 like the guy that titles himself the best in the room. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like at the end of the day, as a salesperson, what you have to focus on is not today's numbers. It's the milestones. It's the metrics that you want to achieve. How good do you want to be at this job? And if you want to be a professional at it, then have a professional's mindset. Dial in, shave off rounded or you know rough edges every single point during the process, and you're gonna be better. Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> and this is this is uh, so elementary that it's almost embarrassing to say, right? But I do this every night. Mm -hmm. um, I always journal in some capacity. Sometimes it's a sentence or two. Sometimes it's a page or two. It just depends. Right. And I do that just strictly for my own mental health and growth. Um, and then I catalog them and store them. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is actually insanely powerful to look back on. Mm -hmm. Right. But one thing, and this was upon suggestion of, of my psychologist, because I'm quite prone to, um, not very productive self-talk, right? <laughs> you and me both. Dude. Yeah. So <laughs> he said, I want you to do something positive for yourself because most of my journal entries are like shit that I think I could have done better, mm -hmm. right? And he said that, and I'm fine with that. He said, it, you know, you're kind of taking the trash out, mm -hmm. right? But he said, I want you to do something. At the end of each journal entry, I want you to write down three things, right? 
One, the first thing is something that you're proud of yourself for for the day. Could be anything, right? Second thing, I want you to write down a task that you completed that you didn't want to complete, mm-hmm. right? And the third one is um, in some facet, how did you positively influence somebody else around you, mm-hmm. right? And that's, I've been habitually doing that now for like, I want to say like five months. And um, just the second one Mm -hmm. of what did I get done today that I didn't want to do or that I kept pushing off or whatever it is, it's insanely beneficial. Oh, yeah. And it's like that. I mean, I I think I told you that two years ago or maybe a year and a half ago where I was like, I have a principle that I live by that whatever I don't want to do most is the first thing I have to get done in the day Mm -hmm. because otherwise my brain is clogged with it the whole day. Mm -hmm. Right. So I've always kind of operated that way. But to look back at it in hindsight and be like congratulatory to yourself in a sense of like, good job doing this paperwork you didn't want to do. Right. And I like I told my psychologist, I was like, do you know how stupid I sound to myself? Or I'm like, good job doing your job. (laughs) Right. But he said, it's it's not about that. It's about reaffirming to yourself that you can rely on yourself. Yeah. Well, one is a trust and confidence builder. One, right. is, one is for gratification and just, you know, letting you know you made it somewhere. And the, right. other, the other one is influence. Yeah. It's like if influence is something that motivates you, you should probably talk about it with right. yourself. Like maybe analyze it. Was this influence good? Right. You know, was it was it something that's beneficial for them? And if it was, I mean, you've achieved your day. Right. Right. You know, time is really valuable and you never get it back. So if you're not analyzing the things that go on and you're not purposefully trying to get better and also trying to bring people up with you. What are you doing here? Micro growth. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing here? The atomic yeah. habits really boils one of those, com- those, yeah. those things down that I was talking about. Like the, the guy on the field, he can go way farther than that. Mm-hmm. It's like they, they, they probably have the types of sheet style down and what's in their bed and, you know, what temperature their house is in. So they yeah. get their best sleep. Like yeah. micro, micro. Yeah. You know? I so, do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. You are out there as a professional salesperson. It, it so does. It, I mean, I it, I have a little more flexibility because I don't have as many people in my house. So it's okay for me to keep my house at 64 degrees at night. Which we, is, we, we keep it. Well, Hannah likes it like the Arctic, so it's cold in there. Hell yeah. <laughs> which I don't mind because I sleep no. better when it's cold anyway. Oh, yeah. So. Everybody does. So, so well, anyways, sweet. well, I think that's a good way to wrap up. Uh, you got any other tidbits you want to put out there? No. I mean, if you guys get a chance, try those Oreo Cakesters, though. Oh, yeah. are bomb. Those were pretty bomb. <laughs> they definitely are better than standard Oreos. Oh, so yeah. Way to evolve Oreos. Yeah. But anyways, um, yeah, that's it for today. Please like and subscribe. Engage in the content. Ask us questions. If you'd like to be on the podcast, we'd love to have you on here. Share some of your personal growth tips, some of your leadership strategies. Just anything that you find to be positive in influencing the world around you will bring you on, and uh, you could be part of our mission. So uh, I guess that's it. Catch Hope you guys side. had a good fourth. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't blow those fingers off. Yeah. <laughs>